Okay, it's 103, I think we're gonna start. Hello everyone, welcome to the Disability Screens Office. It's um, first meet and greet. My name is Audrey, I'm with the CBC helping out today. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of tech instructions from the top of the meeting. We are recording, you may have seen a message come up. Um, so because we are recording, we would like for everyone who's not a part of the board um, and who's not a part of the accommodations team to please turn off your um, cameras and mute yourself um, so that just the DSO team is on screen at the moment. Okay, there will be time for questions later on and Winnie will um, touch base on that towards the end of the presentation. Okay, I'm going to now leave my admit responsibilities and leave that up to you, Audrey. And then I am going to start the meet and greet and we're gonna first have Rachel, thank you. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'll give a, a brief description of myself and I'll introduce myself a little bit later, but I am a blonde, uh, blue-eyed woman. I'm wearing some dark lipstick, some beautiful beaded earrings and a green shirt today. I have uh, some visible scarring and I would like to begin this session by acknowledging that I'm joining you from my home in Jojage or Montreal, which is situated on the traditional territory of Reganegahaga, a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganegahaga, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, the Abnaki, and Ishnabe. And while we are meeting virtually, we recognize that the Disability Screen Office operates on the traditional unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous nations across Turtle Island. Recently, I've been reading the book True Reconciliation by Jody Wilson Raybould, and I wanted to share an Ishnave creation story that she retells in her book. She talks about uh, the, the creation in all animals trying to service the spirit woman. The beaver was the first to plunge into the depths. He soon surfaced out of breath and without previous soil. The fisher tried, but he too failed. The marten went down and came up empty-handed, reporting the water was too deep. The loon tried, and although he remained out of sight for a long time, he too emerged, gasping for air. He said it was too dark. All tried to fulfill the spirit woman's request. All failed and all were ashamed. And finally, the least of all the water creatures, the muskrat, volunteered to dive. At this announcement, the other crea water creators laughed in scorn because they doubted this little creature's strength and endurance. Had mm. not they, who were strong and able, been unable to grasp the soil from the bottom of sea, how could he, the muskrat, the most humble among them, succeed when they could not? Nevertheless, the okay. little muskrat volunteered to dive. Undaunted, he disappeared into the waves. The onlookers smiled. They waited for the muskrat to emerge as empty-handed as they had done. Time passed and smiles turned to frowns. The small hope that they had nurtured for the success of the muskrat turned to despair. When the waiting creatures had given up, the muskrat floated to the surface, more dead than alive, but he clutched in his paws a small morsel of soil. Where the great had failed, the small had succeeded. As a disabled person myself, I pull a lot of strength from the example of the muskrat, and I leave this uh, story as a list lesson for the Ishinaabe peoples to remind us and keep in mind the spirit of the muskrat. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Disability Screen Office's very first meet and greet. And just a reminder again at the top for folks just coming in, please, if you are a guest, take your camera off and remember to mute yourself. My name is Winnie Luck, and I am the inaugural executive director of the Disability Screen Office.
I am a Chinese woman with short black hair, wearing a black collared shirt, and my pronouns are she and her. My screen background is white with our DSO logo in both French and English in the top corners. I want to introduce and welcome our ASL interpreters, Shannon Kelly and Lisa Keeling, and our LSQ interpreters, Sarah Hull and Melissa Ann Jean. Could we please go to slide two, please? First off, thank you to our wonderful friends at the CBC for co-hosting and administering this event. And a special shout out to Lisa Clarkson, Karen Clout, and Audrey Larty. Slide number three, please. This slide has a purple banner at the top with white title text and four logos against a white background. Also, a big thank you to our organization funders and sponsors, Telefilm, Accessible Media Inc., Canada Media Fund, and the Canadian Media Producers Association for their support. The DSO would not exist without them. Slide number four, please. This is our agenda. Purple banner at the top with white text title. We will be doing the land acknowledgement, which was already done. And then we'll be going to introductions, myself, the board, the strategic priorities, governance. We're gonna do an update on activities and our initiatives. And then we're gonna give everyone a chance to ask questions at the end. Slide number five, please. Purple banner at the top with white title text, introductions, black text against white background with my name and title. And I want to share a little bit about myself. My lifelong encounters with mobility disabilities as well as my identities as a Chinese queer woman fuel my passion for advocating for accessibility rights and fostering equity in all communities. I essentially live and breathe equity. Before the DSO, I was the managing director of Rainbow Railroad, an international organization registered as a charity in both Canada and the United States, whose mission is to help LGBTQI plus individuals escape persecution and violence from around the world and find safety. I was with Rainbow Railroad for four years. Prior to that, I was the director of operations and events at Inside Out, the presenter of the Toronto and Ottawa 2S LGBTQI plus film festival. I was with them for 16 years. And previous to that, I was working with the city of Toronto in the Parks and Recreation Department, where I supervised recreational and accessibility programming. When I saw the posting for the DSO executive director role, I couldn't imagine a better fit, a role that literally combined all my experience in human rights, film and accessibility programming, along with my personal lived experience. This was fate, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you all to lead this organization in collaboration with the disability community and the Canadian screen industry to advocate for accessibility rights and disability representation on and off the screen. Thank you to the board of directors who appointed me and for placing their trust in me to undertake this vital mission. I have worked with many boards and sat on many boards myself. And let me tell you, hands down, this is one of the most dedicated, knowledgeable and supportive boards I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And I want you all to meet them. Slide six, please. The slide has a purple banner at the top with a title text, DSO Board of Directors, black text against a white background with all the names of the board members. I will be calling out to each of the board members to please introduce themselves and also let everyone know why you decided to join the Disability Screen Office Board of Directors. First up, Yasmin. Hello, bonjour, je vais parler un peu en français pour le début. I'll be speaking a bit in French uh, to start with. My name is Yasmin Laranj, and I'm the chairperson of the board. I'm a woman with a clear skin, uh, short hair, uh, dark short hair, and uh, curly. I wear big glasses, and I'm dressed in black. Long career in the federal public service. 
in my last job, I was the deputy minister for public service accessibility. And my mandate was to prepare the entire Canadian public service to meet the challenge and the requirements of the Accessible Canada Act. I was the first visibly disabled person to become a deputy minister in the federal government in its entire history. When I was invited to join the board of the Disability Screen Office, I was thrilled because it gave me the chance to combine different aspects of my life, things that I care deeply about. I am passionate about accessibility and about disability representation and about unleashing the amazing talents of the community of people with disabilities in this country. I'm also somebody who has a background in the arts and a deep love of the creative sector. In my youth, I was a musician. I worked in radio and in community television. And I'm so excited about the DSO and what we're going to do together to transform an industry and a sector that needs to recognize and appreciate and, and showcase the talents of this incredible community. And I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity to meet with everybody here today. Thank you, merci. Thank you, Osman. Rehan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rehan Azmat. I'm a South Asian middle-aged man with a mostly white beard. It's wonderful to be here. I, I've uh, joined the DSO board with a uh, background in entertainment and media. I started my career uh, earning my chartered accounting designation at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I specialize within the entertainment and media division where I had clients like IMAX and Sony and uh, Can West and Alliance Atlantis, and then uh, progressed through Cineplex Entertainment, where I've held various positions. I'm now the Vice President of Financial Planning and Analysis for Cineplex Entertainment. I was diagnosed with a extraordinarily rare muscle condition in my early 20s. Um, it's uh, progressive and degenerative, and uh, I've been fully confined to a wheelchair for the last 10 years. Um, when you asked about why I joined the board, so I'll, I'll share a short story. That story goes that when I was in my late teens, I really wanted to be in the film industry. And being the son of a, uh, the eldest son of an immigrant father, my father said, nope, you're going to be an accountant or a doctor or an engineer. I really love film. So I found my way through accounting and finance into the film industry. I'm very, very much in, in love with my job. But it was about 10 years ago when I did first fully get confined to the wheelchair, my father said, aren't you glad that you didn't uh, end up going into the film industry? Because the wheelchair would have made things quite difficult. So it made me think. And uh, that in itself, uh, when you think about it, is why I'm here at the DSO today. So thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a wonderful board to be a part of, and I look forward to meeting you all in person as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Ken. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I uh, speak to you from uh, Treaty 6 uh, territory, which is Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where I'm visiting my mother, uh, 99 years old, and enjoying my time here back in my home city of Saskatoon. I live in Toronto. Uh, I'm now retired as a partner and as general counsel at Deloitte. Uh, this morning, I'm wearing a green T-shirt. I have uh, dark rim glasses. And I'm, I think, the only typically able to, uh, person on the, uh, on the board of the DSO. Um, my role is around governance. Uh, I was secretary to the board at Deloitte for 20 years. I did a lot of governance work. I also chaired uh, two boards, the Learning Partnership and the Ethics Center boards. So I've got uh, considerable experience in the not-for-profit world. I echo... Winnie's comments, this is a phenomenal board, uh, hugely diverse and wonderfully talented, and it's a true pleasure to work with all of them. When I was asked to serve on the board, uh, it was an easy answer to say yes. Uh, Ten years ago, I was chair of a panel for the federal government, which looked at employment of people with disabilities in the private sector. Uh, since then, uh, as people know, I've been on a journey uh, I think this is probably the most important thing for the Canadian economy and the Canadian society is, 
is the full inclusion of people with disabilities. This is one part of it, but it's a very important part of it. Um, I am now retired. I am managing director at the Return on Disability Group, uh, working very closely with Rich Donovan, whom many of you probably know. Thanks, Winnie. Thank you, Ken. And just briefly for new guests coming in, a reminder to please go off camera and to mute your um, mic. Next up, we have Sasha. Almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sasha Borsma. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white middle-aged woman with blonde hair. Might see some pink and purple on Zoom. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm wearing glasses, a dark gray top, and uh, you may also catch a glimpse of the red dress pin that I'm also wearing made of red dyed seal skin and white and red beads. And I also tend to fidget a lot and move around. <laughs> I am uh, explained because I'm a late diagnosed autistic who also manages ADHD, anxiety and learning disabilities and celiac disease the lovely collection of neurodivergent and chronic illness. It's fantastic. Um, for the past 10 years, I have been a co-founder and producer of Sticky Brain Studios, a family-friendly video game company based in Toronto, where about half of our staff are people with variety of invisible disabilities. And by accident, it just had to do with the way that we operate our company and uh, happen to be an inclusive space. I'm also a contract professor at Centennial College in, uh, in downtown Toronto, where I teach production accounting for film and television. Prior to all of this, I worked in business affairs of film and television. I worked for uh, private and public funders, uh, broadcasters, independent producers in children's media distribution and digital media. And why I joined the DSO, um, on sharing with my graduate level college students about my disabilities, increasingly they would share with me their disabilities. And even though in the Ontario college system, there are pretty decent supports for people with disabilities, there is nothing. They step out into industry, they mask, they hide, they make themselves more ill because they can't be themselves or they're afraid that if someone finds out, they'll get seen as incompetent and fired. Or worse yet, especially in the case of neurodivergent behaviors, they act a little differently and immediately become excluded. And it was through hearing those stories over and over again that a year ago I went, that I, I need to get involved with DSO. I saw the Accessibility Lab program announced with Real Abilities Film Festival. And I went, yeah, that's the work that needs to be done in this industry. And that's where I wanna put my advocacy efforts. And that's why I'm here. Thank you, Sasha. Rachel. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, just a reminder for my francophone friends, if you'd like to listen to the translation in French, uh, there is a little globe icon at the bottom of your page. You can click interpretation and hear uh, French translation. Uh, I will introduce myself in both languages. My name is uh, Rachel Desourdi. As I said previously, I'm a woman, uh, a white woman. Uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, my 30s, uh, I have uh, curly hair. I have a very dark uh, uh, lipstick, and I have a lot of uh, uh, visible uh, scars on my face. My name is a letter R. I'm, uh, I can't hear well, uh, among other experiences that I've uh, had with uh, chronic diseases, uh, you know, uh, uh, real issues uh, with my development uh, uh, following a uh, genetic uh, condition that I've had since my uh, birth. I'm based in Montreal. I'm f proud to be Franco-Canadian and to represent uh, um, linguistic diversity uh, within uh, this board. I use she, her pronouns. My academic background is I have a Bachelor of Science from McGill University and a Master of Arts in Critical Disability Studies from York University. Um, I have um, 
really early on in my academic career, I thought I wanted to go into the health profession. I was on the waiting list to be fast tracked to med school. And it was when I started my undergrad that I realized that um, while health uh, advocacy was important, I was way more interested in the culture and the societal uh, issues surrounding disability and making change from, some, from a systemic uh, point of view rather than an individual medical one. And so that has guided my choice of career, my passion so far as my day job. Uh, I am the accessibility lead for CBC Radio Canada, Canada's public broadcaster, which I had a lot of fun uh, doing. And why I chose to join the DSO was I am still waiting for the day where I see a show or anything on screen that looks and reflects the life that I've lived as a young person with a disability growing up in Canada. And so I'm very excited to, I believe that uh, the media has the power to change the world. And that's a part of the change that I want to be part of. And so um, that is why I'm involved. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And just a note, I will also be happy to answer questions in French if anyone has some at the end of the uh, discussion. Thank you, Rachel. Pras. Hello, everyone. My name is Prasana. You can call me Pras. My mom does. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am thrilled to be a member of the DSO Board of Directors. In a prior life, I was a human rights lawyer for 13 years before transitioning into leading diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and accessibility work across a range of sectors, including the justice sector, judicial appointments, the international development space, the media and entertainment industry, the tech sector, the financial services sector, and public safety. For me, a huge part of my work has been animated by the question of whose stories are told in this world and whose stories are not, who has access to places and spaces and who are denied opportunity to be in those places. As a racialized queer person with a disability, I'm blind. So much of my work is animated by doing that work, being a part of that story. I truly believe that who I am is what I bring, just as I bring my education, my skills, my experience to everything that I do, I bring my dimensions of diversity. As a person sitting before you today wearing a yellow sweater, a blue floral shirt with curly hair, South Asian skin, I am proud to be a member of the DSO Board of Directors. And I'm really, really passionate about being here because I believe that stories have the opportunity to not just reflect the world in which we live, but imagine the world we seek to build. And I hope that in our work together, we imagine a more equitable and inclusive world. Thanks, Winnie. Thanks, Pras. Anna Karina. Mute, unmute. Ah, je m'excuse. My bad. I'm sorry. Je m'excuse tout le monde. Je I'm sorry, everyone. My name is uh, Anna Carrier Tabillor. Je utilise les pronoms elle, elle, uh, elle uh, et, et je suis venu ici via Montréal et Chicago. Et originalement, je suis né aux Philippines. J'ai des longs cheveux uh, noirs avec une peau bronzée et je porte des des lunettes uh, épaisses. Je suis une femme uh, d'âge moyenne qui est encore un cœur très jeune. Je suis en communication d'entreprise. J'ai travaillé dans les secteurs publics et euh, publics. J'ai travaillé en sécurité de l'aviation et des euh, services. J'ai une petite agence de communication stratégique et alors que je complète mon euh, un, un diplôme universitaire de deuxième cycle, je veux amener une réhabilitation de la COVID à travers une lentille historique assez très proche de... My motor skills, my cognitive function and my vision. So why did I join? J'ai des handicaps qui sont causés par... I'm a huge fan of the Canadian screen industry. It was TV News and Sesame Street that were my English tutors. And now as a grown-up, um, I was fortunate to have a career in broadcast journalism and as a documentary filmmaker. I understand firsthand the barriers to entry and success in the screen industry. 
So working with the DSO, I want to make sure that my experience is not the exception, but the rule, and that people who look and sound and operate differently have a meaningful place in the screen industry. Most of my was uh, in English, uh, but it'll be a pleasure for me to improve my French. And uh, but now I'd like to hand over the mic to uh, Yasmin, the uh, board, uh, the, the uh, chairman of the board. Merci, Anna, Karina. Um, so if we yes, we have slide seven up. That's great. So I'll just uh, read to you what you are what is on this slide. Uh, there is a purple banner at the top with white title text saying Disability Screen Office. And then this slide is about our mission and vision. And so the text tells us what the mission and the vision is of the DSO. And I will read this for you. The Disability Screen Office is a national disability-led not-for-profit organization that works with the Canadian screen industry to eliminate accessibility barriers and foster authentic and meaningful disability representation on and off the screen. And our vision is to realize a Canadian screen sector that is fully inclusive and accessible. And you've heard from our various board members why we're so excited about this vision and this mission and why we're so committed to it. Let me tell you a little bit about the history uh, we're so new. We are a startup. There is no doubt about that. We are in startup mode right now. Um, we were The DSO was actually incubated by Accessible Media Incorporated, AMI, and became an independent organization on September 1st of last year. So barely a year. Uh, AMI appointed the very first interim executive director of the DSO, Andrew Morris. And Andrew's mandate was to get the organization set up. And he is responsible for recruiting most of the board members that are with you here today. And I just want to take this opportunity in front of this entire community to really wholeheartedly thank Andrew. Uh, Andrew, on behalf of the board of directors, on behalf of the broader community, thank you so much for your instrumental and your foundational work with the DSO and your continued support. We would not be where we are today without everything that you've done for us. We wanna wish you the very best as you launch your production company as president and executive producer of Hitsby Entertainment. Um, and as I uh, mentioned earlier, we officially became an independent organization on September the 1st last year. But April 1st of this year, 2023, marked the beginning of our first official year of operations. That was the beginning of our fiscal year. And so we're super excited about what the future will hold. And I'd like to pass it over now to Anna Karina to tell you about some of our strategic priorities. Anna Karina, je, je cède la parole à toi. Merci encore, Yasmin. Anna Karina, you have the mic now and it uh, outlines three key priorities. It says DSO's priorities in its first year startup phase. The first is build sustainable structure for the DSO. The second, secure strategic partnerships and funding. And third, raise the profile of DSO and the value of disability inclusion. Um, so some background on that. The last several months, as Yasmin said, we have been in startup mode with an intense focus on building a foundation that enables this organization to drive our vision. Um, we've been working very hard, as you'll hear more a little bit later from Ken, to build a governance framework for the DSO, one that allows us to be nimble, proactive, and sustainable. Um, we brought together, or Andrew has helped pull together a team of people with very diverse backgrounds and expertise. Um, and we're all volunteers. And the powerful connective tissue between us is our shared values and our common vision for an accessible screen industry. We've been meeting almost bi-weekly on operations and strategy. Um, four months ago was one of our 
biggest milestones. After countless hours and an exhaustive search, we appointed our first ED after Andrew, um, and you've met Winnie. Um, so together, we've identified our next steps, which we'll hear about in a moment. Um, our success hinges on our ability to attract allies and secure partnerships and funding. We've been working with a range of stakeholders, so producers, government regulators, and broadcasters, to educate them about the barriers within the industry, as well as their role in removing the structural and attitudinal barriers. And as we educate, we're also building the DSO brand and profile and promoting the tremendous value of disability inclusive storytelling and an inclusive screen industry. Now, um, I'd like to turn it over to Ken to explain how we work and our governance structure. Ken, over to you. Merci beaucoup. Uh as chair of the governance at the DSO. Uh, so uh, not-for-profits struggle with a governance model that is sustainable and will adapt uh, and also want it to be representative of the community, uh, to have a diverse set of skills and experience, and uh, to be a passion about the mission, which you've heard from the uh, majority of which, uh, and- All right, yep. in and out. If you maybe you, take off uh, your uh, video, and it might help with the connection. Thank you. Did we fully oh, lose Kevin? I'll take oh. off my video. My apologies. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, I hope. Can yes, you I hear think me? So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. I apologize. Just wave if you don't. So there will be a twelve-person board, the majority of which uh, will be people with disabilities, and as best as possible, as you can see today, it will be diverse. We're going to build in succession, and we're probably going to do that through. Um, a limit of two terms of two years each uh, so that we get turnover on the board, which is which is important uh, for uh, an effective, healthy board. Um, we're going to have five committees. Which will be composed both of board members and also uh, the committees will be the finance committee, the governance committee, the talent committee, marketing and communications and funding and partnerships. So those are the five committees. Um, the status today, uh, we're near final on various board policies. Uh, you can imagine there'll be a number of board policies, the mandate for the board and the establishment of the committees. Uh, board. So those are near final. Bind to populating the committees, which may be of interest to you. Uh, stay tuned on that front. Uh, we'll be getting further information out to you. But also reach out to Winnie if you're interested. And uh, again, we're going to set up committees that are representative of the community. I'll stop there. Thanks, Winnie. Thank you, Ken. Next slide, please. Slide 10. One before, please. Thank you. This is update on DSO activities with a purple banner at the top with white text titled update on DSO activities. I am just over three months at the DSO and it's been an incredible but busy three months. I'm the only staff member at the moment and you can imagine how much work and opportunities we have ahead of us. I am so grateful to have an operational board at this moment, let me tell you. Before I came on, but before I came on, there was community consultations to hear what community priorities were and to understand the landscape in which we were working with, within. And when I started, I also met with each of the board members individually and asked them what their priorities were for the first year and what their priorities were for the three years to come. And our activities and planned initiatives have been based on these priorities that came out of the consultations and my individual meetings. So sustainable funding, 
such a priority for us right now for both operations and programs. And with the support of our board, I've been applying to numerous funds and writing proposals for both operations and programming. I hope to be announcing a very big partnership soon and adding many more logos to slide three at the beginning in the coming months. Community engagement, building relationships, partnerships and collaborations, building our brand and reputation as subject matter experts and as a trust resource for all things disability related in the community and screen sector and to be recognized as a model for accessibility and disability work internationally. I had essentially hit the ground running from day one where I participated on the CBC and CMPA one-stop shop panel on my very first day, literally within my very first few hours in this role. I produced and moderated a panel at the Sears Toronto International Film Festival just a couple of weeks ago called Breaking Barriers, Shattering Ceilings, Advancing Accessibility and Inclusion for People with Disabilities in the Screen Industry with our esteemed board members, Sasha and Prasna, as well as industry and disability leaders, Ophira Kalaf and Megan McTeer. And just yesterday, I spoke on a panel at TO WebFest called Making Productions Accessible. So just to name a few panels that I've already participated in. I've also been sitting on various roundtables across the country. I've been consulting on events, projects, and reports, as well as writing support letters for others to apply for accessibility funding. I've met with countless community members, organizations, and other equity-seeking or, or groups, recognizing that intersectionality is key in our work and that disability intersects with every community and identity. Everyone at one point in their lives will have a disability. Breaking down accessibility barriers is, a, is good for everyone. And accessibility rights are human rights. The DSO is in startup mode. And it's important to me to meet as many people as possible right now, not only to introduce them to what we are doing, but to partner with them and credit and spotlight other organizations supporting this work as well. Collaborations are crucial to the DSO's success and longevity. Another priority is being at government roundtables informing policy. We submitted responses to both the CRTC and Canadian Heritage for the modernized policy framework as an outcome of Bill C-11. This also took place within my first couple of weeks and I myself learned a lot from this process. Another priority is representation nationwide. In my first week, I flew to Banff to represent DSO at the Banff Media Festival, where I met with industry leaders and representatives from across the country. This was very inspiring and meaningful for me to get to meet folks from Canada screen industry wanting to support the DSO and help us or help set us up. This trip made me very optimistic for the future of our work. I will be flying to Vancouver next week to represent DSO at Vancouver International Film Festival. And the CMPA and Creative BC has graciously offered to host me in a casual in-person meet and greet on October 3rd, 12 noon Pacific time. And in November, I'll be heading to Montreal for their International Documentary Festival. And at the end of January, we'll be participating in CMPA's prime time in Ottawa. We'll be bringing a delegation as well. And thank you to Warner Brothers Discovery Access Canada for sponsoring the DSO and a delegation to attend and participate. It is a priority of the DSO to make sure we meet and work with and represent people from across the country, coast to coast and north, and working and collaborating with people and communities within those provinces and territories. We recognize that each province and region is unique and might have different ways of working. So we wanna respect that and listen and support them as best we can. We're in the midst of developing a communications plan, which is fluid in nature and will help guide us as we build our communication tools and channels. Capacity building, this is so important. Building our operations, our infrastructure, our talent and developing policies and procedures. Please keep an eye out. We will be posting for a couple of paid part-time roles to support the DSO as we are building our organization and activities. Slide 11, please. I wanna pass this on to Sasha to talk about our initiatives that we are hoping to launch development this year. Excellent, thank you, Winnie. And we'll stay top level with this uh, just so we have enough time to make sure that we get in any questions that might come up. On this slide, slide 11, the purple banner at the top reads DSO initiatives. 
uh, and the three points that we have are point one, best practices guide to disability engagement in the Canadian film and television industry research project phase two. Initiative number two is the industry resource hub. And initiative number three are job descriptions and training for a production accessibility role. For the best practices guide to disability engagement in the Canadian film and television industry, we started initially with phase one support, uh, and I with thanks to um, the CMF, so that we could scope out what needed to be done with this. There is no research out there that fully collects how many people with disabilities are working in the industry, let alone where are the people not working in the industry. We've been very actively working with uh, funders across the country to raise the financing needed to be able to uh, make this happen. We are working with Nordicity uh, to build the surveys and the roundtables. And hopefully by the end of this year, we will be able to make more of a splash with it, with more information out to the community, including getting your feedback and your input of your experiences. Activity number two with the indoor industry resource hub. The thing that we keep hearing is, how do I find a, and the resource hub is the step one to that, uh, to make sets more accessible, to collect reports, best practices that already exist around the world. And so our phase one to this is building the database structure, as well as collecting uh, service providers, research information, et cetera. So that way, this is at the fingertips of producers, directors, writers, production managers and anyone else in the industry looking for more information about disability and accessibility. When that is complete, then we will look ahead to phase two and start to consider uh, building it out to include a human resource uh, as well for people looking for talent with disabilities. For initiative number three, I'm going to uh, throw it over to Prasanna to explain further. Thank you so much, Sasha. So when it comes to the production accessibility coordinator role, this is a role in a framework that was established in the United States and has been gaining slow traction across different productions. What we want to do at the DSO is imagine what a production accessibility role could look like on productions across the country and create a best practices guide, a job description, and associated support training materials and advocacy initiatives to help people with disabilities access opportunities on productions across the country. And to also work with productions to ensure that accessibility is not treated as a feature or a nice to have, mm -hmm. but is a must have animating force that informs how we design productions to create inclusive and accessible opportunities. And also develop accessibility training for industry professionals, including associations, guilds, unions, and producers and individual leaders to make sure that accessibility and disability inclusion are a meaningful part of what we do and how we work. And with that, I will turn it over to Yasmin, who will be moderating the question and answer component, where we want to invite all of your questions to make sure you have a great understanding of how the DSO operates. Thank you, Pras. And, um... Thanks for that wonderful overview. Now, I am conscious of time. We've got about 15 minutes left in this session. And we wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to have to provide questions and to have some answers from uh, representatives of the DSO. I want to assure you that we will keep track of all of the questions that are being asked and we will, we will respond to you using, um, using our, our website and, I, I just, I don't want anybody to think that we're not going to be paying attention to your questions, even though we have limited time. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to use the chat function, please, um, if, if you can, to put your question uh, to, to us and we'll shoot it to different members of the board and to Winnie, depending on the question. Um, if that doesn't work for you, if the chat function is not um, accessible for you, then uh, please use the, um, please use the uh, reaction mode to put your hand up. And uh, that will also identify us in terms of having questions. So I'm going to kick it off because we do have, oh, look at this, we're getting a whole lot. I'm gonna start off with this one because I think this is the burning question. And um, Rehan, I'm putting you on notice. This question yeah. is for you. Uh, it comes from Stephen. How much funding do you have and how stable is it? And I think that is a 
Great question. Thank you so much for asking. Rahan, can I can I ask you to uh, take that Absolutely. question, please? As treasurer, that would be my duty. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, you know, so that's an opportunity. We talk about this being a foundation, the foundational funding that came from Telefilm and the CMF with uh, in conjunction with AMI. This was great to get us started. We are very, very much in startup mode, um, which means that we're looking at two different ways of funding. The first way of funding really comes from the unrestricted funds to allow us to actually get our operations on the move. So that is not restricted to specific projects that we went through earlier, but actual funding to get our office set up. Our primary um, source of uh, expense is our um, is our staffing, of which there is one in Winnie. Um, but as we get additional operational funding, we'll continue to grow the office. The second source of funding, which is the uh, restricted funds, as we refer to it, which is for direct projects, there's a portion of that that allows for this office to also use for administrative purposes. But really, right now, we're looking for that foundational funding that will allow the office to continue to grow. So to answer your question more directly, Stephen, we do have a runaway of a few months to continue to operate, but it's going to be very, very critical, as was number one uh, objective that was stated earlier in the presentation for us to ensure that we have operational funds for us to continue to grow the organization and then execute on our mandate. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Rehan. Uh, I have another question here that I'm going to ask Sasha to take. Um, it, it comes from Landon. And uh, Sasha, do, you, do we have any plans to initiate grant programs for disabled filmmakers, whether for short films, development, documentaries, series, or features? Sasha, can you answer that? I, I sure can. So the to build funding programs, we need to raise funding from other sources. There is a lot happening right now as part of the modernization of the industry. That's an outcome of Bill C-11. And there's a few options, which is, does the DSO create a fund and, and try to get people to contribute to it? Or do we work with the existing funds to ensure that they are more aware and inclusive of, of people with disabilities, accessibility needs, et cetera? At this point, we're looking at both options. We are actively working with the funding agencies, Telefilm, CMF, Ontario Creates, Creative BC, the private funds, to talk about how do we make them more accessible and more supportive of creators with disabilities. At the same time, we've asked the CRTC to leave the door open to allow for opportunities of new private funds, in which case we find that there are specific needs still required by people with disabilities, and then be able to tap into you know, the supports from streamers, whatnot, to create funds specific. So as Yasmin said, we're still new. We're only a year into it. Uh, lots is happening in the industry, and we are on top of it, but it does take time. The first step will probably be working with the existing funds and make them as supportive and accessible as possible while we also work through the CRTC on any new funding opportunities. Thanks so much, Sasha. I've got a couple of questions here that I'm going to bundle and I'm going to ask Winnie to take it because they're about communications and engagement. So, um, for, so I'll put them together. Is there a way for industry members to opt in for future communications from the DSO? And how can we stay up to date on upcoming job opportunities within the DSO? Winnie? Wonderful. So right now our primary communication tool is our e-newsletter. So when you go to our website and at the very end, you'll have a final slide with an email and our website posted, but our website is used right now as one, it's a landing page, but two, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. So that is our primary um, communication channel. We also do have an existing LinkedIn page as well. I do know it was created to post my role originally, but that is our one and only social channel. And as we are working developing our communications plan, we are going to select the socials um, that we are going to develop in the future, in the near future. And also, as we build our team, that will also help support building uh, content creation. And uh, this, oh, the question about potential um, and future job postings, I will be releasing that in our e-newsletter, as well as posting on our LinkedIn, and also reaching out to all our wonderful partners and collaborators um, across the sector to also help post and boost the postings as well. Winnie, maybe I could ask you to put in the chat and to let people know um, 
what email address can they use if they if they want to get in touch? Yes, definitely. So I'll put my personal one and there will be an info one as well. Perfect. Because I think that will be helpful as we're, I think as you pointed out, we're definitely um, trying to ramp up on, uh, on our communication side. We've still got a lot of work to do on that. So I'm moving into, um, I've got a really interesting question here. Um, you talked a lot about disability inclusion in the industry. I took television broadcasting in college and acceptance for me as a person with a disability was hard to get as there was a lot of group work and this was even before entering any paid position. People saw my walker before they saw me as a person. How do we bring down this stigma in post-secondary to make sure the film industry is more accessible and inclusive? I'm Sasha, can I ask you, because you're in post-secondary and you are in that industry, maybe you'd like to answer that. I, I definitely can. And then uh, Prasna and Rachel definitely jump in if there's a point that, that you can add um, from your experiences. Uh, it is a problem. And I can only speak to the Ontario public, public college system and even then only a handful of colleges. I know Post-secondary is very complex when you grab the entire map across the country from the universities to the polytechnic institutes to the technical institutes, public colleges, private colleges, and everything in between. Many of the professors in those institutions come from industry. And so the bigger picture is as DSO works, we I, I definitely know that we will over the next year or two have to reach out to the public institutions because they are a source of the problem. I've also heard stories of people who walked into their admission sessions and faculty took one look at them and said, no, you have no chance in this industry. And they walked out. Um, so there's ableism in admissions, there's ableism within the programs from faculty, there's within the students, um, and then of course getting out in industry. I don't have one huge answer, but I do know that that is on my personal radar as someone who works in post-secondary, and it's one of my goals that DSO does reach out to the academic institutions as part of the information and training needed. Um, and anyone here who is a post-secondary student who just wants some support, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. I'll pop myself in the meeting chat um, and feel free to drop me a note. I'm happy to just be a supportive shoulder wherever <laughs> where I can. I don't know, Prasanna or Rachel, if from your experience in human rights and academia, if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm happy to quickly add in. I think the intersection around disability inclusion and accessibility is really vital to underscore. I think so often when we think about accessibility or non-disabled people think about accessibility, the focus tends to be on physical accessibility alone, but barriers to accessibility can be physical, they can be information and communication related, they can be systemic, including the failure to accommodate, and they can be attitudinal or ableist, as Sasha outlined. And I think one of the powerful things that the DSO can do in partnership with organizations is use and leverage the power of storytelling to shatter those myths and misconceptions that people hold about us as people with disabilities, as being less worthy, as being less intelligent, as being less able to contribute. Those myths are corrosive. They exist across the industry. And one of the key work, one of the key works of that the screen industry needs to take on, but the DSO also needs to advance is how do we tell inclusive stories to shatter those myths? Because when we do that work, we then can address all of the opportunities along the journey from educational institutions to internship opportunities to all skills of the production process through to leadership. And when we do that, when we address ableism at all steps of that process, we can create an industry that's inclusive and we cannot do it until we do that. So I'm really grateful for this question. And I wanna say as much as it seems like it's relegated to only the education space, these are issues that exist across the industry that we need to address. Maybe I'll just add to those uh, very on point thoughts. My perspective is that we cannot advance anything without community. And I think that's one of the strengths of the Disability Screen Office is finding a place for people to bring 
these barriers that they're experiencing for us to uh, show counter examples. You know, um, with every struggle, there's someone who is the first somewhere and we can, uh, you know, use that as a way to leverage and to create more access and more opportunities and more representation for others. And I think that that's one of the promises of the DSO is that the potential for uh, that those community connections so that we don't have to experience barriers in isolation. So that would be my addition Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Proz. Um, nous avons reçu une question avant cette émission et je voulais la partager. Je vais, uh, poser We la... got a question, and I'm going to ask this question before Rachel. How are you going to make sure that you will uh, represent the uh, French speaking sector in Canada? That's an excellent question. Thank you for that question, Rachel. So, uh, the mic is yours. Uh, um, and because we are a pan-Canadian organization, it's very important for us to represent uh, uh, linguistic the linguistic diversity, which includes uh, French speakers and uh, the uh, media industry in Quebec. And there are two things that uh, we're doing right now, which which uh, highlight our priorities. The first one is to ensure a. Uh, uh, French uh, representation or well rep representation of French speaker on the board uh, our board uh, still have places to fill and we are looking for uh, uh, French speaking uh, representatives that would be interested to sit on this board and so we are inviting you if you are personally interested or know somebody who would be interested that you communicate uh, th those names to us because that's one of our priorities. Secondly, our uh, research project, which was uh, unveiled uh, earlier on, will uh, make sure that uh, we look at the nuances uh, within the creative uh, community uh, 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 in the French sector in Canada, including within the uh, English part of that industry to make uh, sure that we can identify what's at stake here and the issues and the opportunity that uh, are um, offered to us. So those two things uh, are things that are uh, at the forefront right now. I'm very conscious of time and I know we having to drop out already because we only blocked an hour. I'm thrilled by the feedback that we've gotten and what a wonderful uh, chat that we're having. Uh, we're definitely going to hold on to this. We're going to hold on to the questions that you've sent us. Um, we have on the screen now how you can contact us. Um, so email info at DSO hyphen O-R-P-H-E dot C-A, or you can sign up for our e-newsletter list, www.dso hyphen O-R-P-H-E dot C-A. And Winnie, can I throw it back to you to, to yes. wrap up what's been a great conversation and for sure we'll be getting back to people with responses to the questions we weren't able to get to today. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. And just thank you for joining us today. You know, join our DSO journey as we build this organization together with all of you. And this is only the beginning. We will be hosting more meetings to come. So please stay tuned to gather more feedback and to hear from you. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye.